Hi, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in our series on the Inflation Reduction Act and the energy credits uh, it provides for. Today, we'll be discussing manufacturing credits, supply chain, and tariff issues, uh, among other things. Uh, my name is Jacob Stevens, and I'm an attorney in Hush Blackwell's tax group. Uh, and before we jump into the content, uh, we need to go over a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application icons for your use during the program. Uh, if you have any questions during the webcast, please submit via the question box. We will try to answer all the questions during the webcast today, but if a fuller answer is needed or if we run out of time, we will answer it later via email. Uh, a PDF of the presentation is available in the program materials folder, along with written questions and answers from our last webinar on tax impacts for carbon capture, hydrogen, and other fuels. Uh, this program has been approved for legal education hours. To report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you next week, along with a recording of the webcast for your watching and sharing, along with the questions and answers from this week. Uh, you can also find the links to the recordings from parts one and two in the audience console and uh, toward the end of the program, be sure to complete our short survey. We use your feedback to plan future programs that are applicable to your business needs. Uh, presenting with me today is Doug Jones and Jeff Neely. Doug's deep experience in tax law includes practical strategies for clients regarding mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, workouts in and out of bankruptcy, recapitalizations, divestures, spinoffs, entity formations, as well as all forms of capital raising activities. Uh, Jeff has more than 25 years of experience representing private parties in international trade remedies disputes in the United States and in foreign jurisdictions. He guides clients in matters including anti-dumping investigations, countervailing duties, subsidies, intellectual property disputes, as well as related customs export control, and other import and export issues. That is all for the housekeeping items. And Doug, I will turn it over to you to jump into the content. Thank you, Jacob. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is, as Jacob mentioned, our third webinar uh, in our series on the IRA. And uh, in our first, uh, the, the other two webinars are available uh, for viewing online on our website. Um, the first website, we covered the ITC extension um, and the new clean energy investment credit, uh, the PTC extension and the new clean energy production credit, as well as a lot of details on the multipliers, um, like the wage and apprenticeship, uh, domestic content, energy community, and low income community multipliers. Um, that webinar, the first one, also went into a lot of detail on uh, direct pay and transferability. So if any of those are topics um, which you're interested in and you haven't seen that webinar, please feel free to check it out. Uh, and then similarly in webinar number two, we discuss carbon capture, hydrogen, and alternative fuels. So uh, with that, we will dive right into the manufacturing credits. Um, first up is 45X. Uh, so this is the Advanced Manufacturing Production Credit. Uh, it is a new tax credit uh, for domestic production and sale of eligible components. Um, some of the requirements are that the eligible component must be produced by the taxpayer. Uh, it must be sold, the eligible component must be sold to an unrelated person. Um, and there's kind of an exception to that rule where an affiliate of the taxpayer or a related party can be the party that makes the ultimate sale to an unrelated person. So you can have sort of a you know, selling agent or something like that. Um, the eligible component needs to be produced and sold by the taxpayer as part of its trade or business. And the production has to occur in the United States or in a possession. The policy behind this is to bring you know, the manufacturing of these critical components uh, to achieving you know, the climate goals uh, that the IRA is trying to make um, make advances with respect to, uh, to bring that kind of manufacturing here to the United States and to help alleviate some of the uh, supply chain clogs, which has um, slowed down the development um, of renewable energy. Um, 
a person is also treated as having sold an eligible component to an unrelated person um, if such component is integrated or incorporated in, or assembled into another eligible component. So we'll, we'll go into great detail on what these components are, um, but if you're manufacturing solar modules and you also manufacture the photovoltaic cell uh, and that cell goes into the module, then you're going to be able to you know, treat it as if you had produced and sold both of those eligible components. Um, and, you know, it's important to keep in mind that this is a production type credit. So the credit is based on the amount of eligible components that are produced. Um, and it applies to components that were produced and sold after December 31, 2022. Now, there is a little bit, we're still waiting on lots of guidance for lots of stuff that's in the IRA, but we got a little bit um, with respect to this um, beginning date of December 31 and how that's going to work with. Uh, when there was a, a colloquy between Senators Warner and Wyden uh, on the Senate floor, where they kind of discussed the intent of the law and confirmed that if a portion of a component is produced prior to December 31, 2022, um, that the intent is for the entire component, not just some amount proportional to the production completed after that deadline date, is eligible for the credit. Now, colloquies are, you know, if a court had to look at that and interpret it, um, they're sort of, uh, you know, legislative history light. Um, they are given less, um, you know, authoritative weight than other sources, but it's still a helpful piece of guidance. Um, another interesting thing about the 45X credit is that it is one of the few, if not the only, it's at least one of the few credits uh, dealt with in the IRA that is not subject to the wage and apprenticeship requirements. So now we're going to dig into what the eligible components are. Um, they're split up into different categories. You have solar components, uh, wind components, uh, certain kinds of inverters, battery components, and even uh, applicable critical minerals uh, will qualify. Um, eligible components exclude property that's produced at a facility if the basis of any property in that facility is taken into account for purposes of the 48C credit, and that's another manufacturing credit uh, which was modified by the IRA, and we will be, I will be covering that topic after we're done talking about 45X. But if you, if you have a factory with respect to which you elected the 48C credits, you're not also going to get the 45X. So uh, digging into now the solar energy components. So uh, the first is uh, a, a photovoltaic cell, either a thin film or a crystalline one. And the, this is the, the part of the solar module which performs the conversion of light into electricity. Um, and the, the credit is listed at four cents per direct current watt of capacity. Um, there's also photovoltaic wafers, which is sort of a thin layer of a certain size um, uh, used in solar modules, which you get uh, $12 per square meter for. Um, also solar grade uh, polysilicon, which is highly pure polysilicon suitable for solar manufacturing, um, and that's $3 a kilogram. And uh, uh, polymeric uh, back sheets, which is just the back siding of the solar module, which insulates it from weather and provides electrical insulation. And um, the credit is available for these at 40 cents per square meter. In addition, um, we've got torque tubes, which are the structural tubes and other elements which are going to holding up and rotating a, a solar tracking array. Um, and those are uh, paid out, the credit with respect to those is paid out at 87 cents per kilogram. Um, structural fasteners, similar kind of thing, steel structural elements that kind of hold the tubes together or tie the tubes to the foundation or to anything else or anything else that needs to be kind of connected. Um, and those are $2.28 per kilogram. And finally, the solar modules themselves, the completed thing, which you, you know, can, doesn't require any further assembly that you put on the array and plug in and it starts generating electricity, uh, these are um, eligible for the credit at seven cents uh, per direct current watt of capacity that the module, that the module has. 
Uh, there's also wind energy components. Um, there are credits for the blades, uh, for the nacelles, and for the towers. Um, the amount of the credit uh, varies between two and three or five cents, depending on which component you're talking about. And that you know, cent amount is multiplied by the capacity of the wind turbine uh, for which the component, the blade is designed, for which the tower is designed, for which the nacelle is designed. Um, and, um, and, the, and there are some additional wind energy components that qualify. These include offshore wind foundations, um, either fixed or floating. Um, so this is the thing that kind of secures the offshore wind tower to the sea seafloor, um, either with the fixed or floating platform. Uh, you get either two cents or four cents per capacity of the wind turbine uh, that the platform is, is um, designed for. And then related offshore wind vessels. These are vessels purpose-built or retrofitted for purposes of the development, transport, the installation, the operation, or the maintenance of offshore wind energy components. And these, uh, you get a credit uh, equal to 10% of the sales price. Um, moving on to batteries, uh, some of the uh, the eligible co components for batteries include electrode active materials. So these are cathode or anode materials um, that contribute to the electrochemical process necessary for energy storage. Um, these, you get a credit at, uh, equal to 10% of the cost of production of the materials. Um, the battery cell, um, which is an electrochemical cell uh, composed of positive electrodes and negative electrodes with certain energy density um, requirements. And uh, for battery cells, there's a $35 uh, per kilowatt hour of capacity credit and finally batter, battery modules um, and these you get either a, a ten dollar or a forty five dollar credit uh, depending on whether they include a battery cell inside of the module inverters are also on the list um, inverters are the um, the end products that convert dc electricity from either solar or uh, certified distributed wind energy, energy systems into AC electricity. Um, and the, uh, the amount of credit you get depends on the capacity and what these inverters are designed for. You have central inverters, which are utility scale systems with large capacity of greater than 100 kilowatts. Um, and they, you get 25 cents uh, per watt of capacity for those inverters. Slightly smaller is a utility inverter, uh, which has a capacity of greater than 125 uh, kilowatts, but less than 1,000. And uh, they get 1.5 cents per capacity. Um, and you also have commercial inverters. <clears throat> um, these are inverters suitable for commercial or, or utility scale systems. Uh, and they have to have a capacity of greater than 20 and not greater than 125 kilowatts. They get 2 cents uh, per capacity. Um, getting smaller and smaller still, we have residential inverters. These are inverters suitable for a residence, uh, which meets certain output requirements and has a capacity of not greater than 20 kilowatts, um, 6.5 cents per uh, watt of capacity for those. Uh, micro inverters are inverters suitable to connect to a single solar module, um, and they have a capacity of not greater than 0.65 kilowatts and they get 11 cents um, per uh, capacity of such inverter. And finally, um, there are inverters uh, which can be used in distributed wind systems, um, and they get 11 cents uh, per, per watt of capacity. Now there is in 45X C6, a long list of applicable critical minerals, uh, which I am sure nobody wants me to read all of you know, the 45 types of minerals um, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to in, instead refer you to the section in the code that lists what those minerals are. I'm not even sure I'd be able to pronounce them all anyway. Um, but the credit amount for these is 10% of the cost of production of such minerals. There is a phase out, which is applicable uh, to 45X. Um, the credit phases out after December 31, 2029. And then it's reduced 25% uh, per year um, until it's completely reduced to zero for components sold after December 31 in 2032. 
Um, notably, the phase out does not apply to the production of critical minerals, only the other eligible components that we discussed. So those are the basics, you know, how much you can get, what, what qualifies. Um, turning now to some of the more kind of I guess nuanced or more interesting um, parts about 45X. One question that comes up is who's the manufacturer? So consider a hypothetical. You know, it, it's it's common for people to to manufacture things either you know they can do it themselves with their own employees or they can contract out to have someone do the manufacturing for them. So consider we have Party A who enters into a contract with Party B, uh, whereby Party B will perform certain manufacturing tasks related to eligible components. Um, on party A's behalf, and party A is paying party B to do this. Um, so who gets the credit here, A or B? Well, um, this is something I think it's reasonable to expect guidance to address, but we're not left completely, you know, out in the open without any guidance on this because there, is, there are some, um, some analogous rules in other areas of, of tax law um, specifically uh, in the uh, subpart F and CFC area, um, because we're not going to turn this into a subpart F or CFC webinar, but there are certain benefits for being a manufacturer uh, under those rules, and there are uh, authorities that have been developed to help people determine who is in fact a manufacturer in that area with respect to these sort of contract manufacturing arrangements. And what those authorities on a very high level kind of do is they say, well, the manufacturer is typically, you know, it's a facts and circumstances type analysis. So they look at the facts and circumstances where the manufacturer is typically the party that um, obtains ownership of the, rel of the relevant eligible component. You know, they take title to it um, and kind of retain title until that uh, eligible component is sold to the ultimate customer. Um, the manufacturer uh, is typically the party that has the upside and the downside uh, with respect to the eligible component. Um, so, you know, they, they bear the risk, they capture any gain, or at least most of it. Um, the manufacturer is typically the party that has control over the time and uh, quantity of production. Um, and the manufacturer is also the person who has control over the, the, the quality of the production. Um, so the manufacturer will be the party who can inspect um, and make and direct, uh, you know, how the manufacturing process is to be uh, performed. Um, also, the manufacturer is typically some of the party who owns the relevant tools or dies and any IP uh, related to the component or the manufacturing process. Um, and as I said, you know, this lookout Look out for this to be covered in in, uh, in guidance that addresses 45x. Now, another um, so you know one of the the major you know um, uh, things that the IRA did is it introduced this uh, concept of being able to transfer credits uh, for cash, uh, and 45x is one of the ones that you can do this uh, with respect to. Um, so under 6418A, a taxpayer can elect to transfer all or any portion of a 45X credit um, to another person in exchange for cash. Um, the payment received by the transferor is not gonna be gross income, and the transferee uh, is not gonna get a deduction for the cash payment that they made for the, uh, the credit. Um, additionally, uh, the transferee would not be expected to have income when it utilizes uh, the credit. There is no statutory limit on the upper or lower level of, of you know, price, uh, amount of cash that you need to pay for the transfer of the credit. Um, most people in the market expect that these credits will transfer at a discount. Um, so not on a dollar for dollar basis, but you know, some, some amount lower than that. Uh, but there isn't set that that's up for the party. That's up to the parties to decide what the appropriate, um, prices for the transfer. There's no statutory guidance on that. Maybe there will be in few, few future guidance, but not at the moment. Now, interestingly, uh, the statute also says, you know, kind of the way these, the transfer of the 6418 uh, uh, section works is that when the transferee receives the credit, they effectively step into the shoes of the original taxpayer. Um, 
So one thing people have been wondering about is, well, okay, so if I am the transferee of a credit, I pay someone to transfer the credit to me, can I now elect direct pay on that credit? Um, and, you know, there is an argument, I think, uh, for reading the code, the new sections, the transfer section and the direct and the direct pay section to say that, yes, you can, because that transferee is stepping into the shoes of the transferor and the transferor would have been able to elect direct pay. Um, but this is probably something people are going to wait to get guidance on before, you know, really acting on. But um, there is, I think, a way to read the code to, to support the transferee taking the direct pay uh, on the transfer credit. Uh, and 45X is also one of the three credits which is eligible for direct pay. Any credit is eligible for direct pay if you are a tax exempt entity or a state and local government or, um, you know, or some other um, similar kind of entity. Um, but if you're talking about 45X, you're talking about the hydrogen credit or you're talking about the carbon capture credit, then non tax exempt entities um, can elect direct pay. Um, and, you know, there is in the direct pay section 64. Uh, 17, a provision which says, well, if you elect direct pay with respect to a credit, you also can't transfer it. And that kind of makes sense. It prevents double dipping. Um, but one issue that has come up uh, in my practice and, and perhaps in other people's as well is, well, you know, when you actually read that code section, which talks about you can't elect transfer with respect to a credit that you elected direct pay, you know, the way you would kind of expect that to read is, okay, if I elect direct pay with respect to a specific credit, then I may not also transfer that specific credit. But the way the section, which is 6417D1, cap D, Romanet 3, reads, makes it sound like if you elect direct pay at all with respect to any credit, you may not be able to elect to transfer any credit. Um, so that's a bit of a stumbling block for people who, you know, um, want to be able to kind of slice these things up. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not going to, this is something that guidance is going to have to resolve. Um, either they will say, yeah, the statute is correct as written, or they will, they will modify it. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, finally, now we're going to switch to 45C and then uh, a couple slides in this, and I will turn it over to Jeff to dis discuss um, tariffs and supply chain issues. Um, but first, 45C is the Qualifying Advanced Energy Product Credit. Um, so effective January 1 of 2023, uh, 45C is expanded and it now has $10 billion um, in tax credits. Uh, for factories and facilities that are going to be building um, specified renewable energy components. Uh, the credit rate for this 48C credit is 6% of the amount invested in the new or the upgraded factory or facility, or 30% if applicable wage and apprenticeship requirements are met. Um, Unlike other credits, this is kind of an interesting thing about 45C, or excuse me, 48C, uh, is that the taxpayer cannot avoid these wage and wage and apprenticeship requirements by beginning construction within 59 days from when the IRS publishes guidance on the wage and reporting requirements. A lot of people are trying to get their projects started so they can avoid avoid that requirement. Uh, 48C is not one of the credits that will allow you to do that. Uh, the qualifying advanced energy product projects include projects that that reequip or expand or establish a manufacturing or industrial facility for uh, these types of um, um, eligible components, which are you know production or recycling of renewable energy property, fuel cells, micro turbines, energy storage components, um, things for grid modernization, um, carbon capture equipment. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm running up on the time limit for, for my topic. So, if, you know, the, the rest of the, uh, eligible components are kind of printed there and I'm not going to talk all the way through. 
So uh, one thing to note about the 48C credit is that it was going to work a little bit differently from many of the other credits. This is one that you have to actually apply uh, to get certified by the IRS for. So the other ones, you're just going to kind of elect the credit on your tax return. Um, that election, depending on what the guidance say, may be simple, it may be complex. Um, the, the 48C process is likely going to be more complicated because there's going to be a formal application and an approval process before you can... Um, get the um, get the credit um, and um, so yeah as I was saying factory owners will need to apply to the IRS um, for the credit uh, the IRS will then have 180 days from the date of enactment of the IRA which is August 16th to establish a program to consider and award these certifications um, after the certification occurs applicants will have two years from the date of certification by the IRS to provide evidence that the requirements of the certification have been met and that the project has been actually placed in service. Um, and then once awarded, the IRS will publicly disclose the identity of the applicant and the amount of the credit that they're going to receive. Uh, finally, 40% of the 10 billion in credit is earmarked for factories located in energy communities uh, which are census tracts which uh, have or, uh, or are next to census tracts with kind of historical coal or oil and gas activities. So with that, uh, we have uh, covered the manufacturing credits and I am gonna turn it over to Jeff Neely to discuss um, supply chain and tariff issues. Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Doug. Um... Everybody probably knows that the uh, challenges in the international trade sector have been pretty tremendous over the last few years. And our practice has been really busy in trying to solve some of these problems for, for clients. Um, at the outset, I just want to kind of mention the, the economic side of it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But, you know, clearly everybody uh, who imports or relies on imports, which is, you know, virtually most of the economy has seen increased shipping costs. Uh, they're, they're not at the historical high that they were before. They've come down somewhat, but they still are very high compared to um, where they've been over many years. Um, the results of that have been component sh shortages. Um, people uh, are not able to, to get components for manufacturing. Uh, people who are uh, consumers are not able to get their goods. Uh, and it's, it's been frustrating for everybody. It's all beginning to normalize, it seems, but it's not quite there yet and, and you know, probably won't be for a while. Um, a lot of this has to do with lack of vessel availability coming out of COVID, trucker shortages, port congestion, and it all uh, resulted in, you know, really extended lead times. So that's, um, that's sort of the economic background of it. What I want to spend most of today talking about is something else, which is the legal side, which is my expertise in terms of what we um, what we're seeing in recent um, in recent years. Uh, some going back to even to 2017 or 2018, but others more recent. Um, I want to start with Section 301, which is the 25% tariffs that are on most Chinese goods today. Um, it's an interesting one because I think most people have just built those particular uh, tariffs into their cost structure and passed it along largely to uh, consumers in the United States. Um, so it, it may not have uh, an immediate effect on many items. I think what's happened from what we can tell from our clients is that people uh, at first looked very hard to see if they could avoid the 25% tariffs by looking outside of China. And sometimes that worked, but many times it did not, simply because there weren't a whole lot of options out there other than China for certain inputs. So I want to start with what led to the tariffs. Um, Section 301 is a provision of law that authorizes the U.S. Trade Representative uh, to investigate and take action with regard to unreasonable and discriminatory actions by foreign countries. And in 2017, the Trump administration uh, brought such a case, uh, self-initiated such a case 
against China with regard to uh, their forced, uh, China's forced technology transfers for foreign companies, including U.S. companies investing in China, as well as intellectual property issues and, and a few more minor issues, but those are the two main ones. Um, there was a lot of support for that, I think, both um, you know, on both sides of the aisle and on Capitol Hill. Um, in, after it was initiated in 2017, uh, there was an attempt to negotiate with the Chinese government on this. Um, it really didn't get very far. Um, the U.S. finally gave up. And in March uh, 2018, uh, the Trump administration uh, uh, put in the first wave of uh, tariffs uh, to offset these unfair practices. So that those lists were called lists one and two. Um, they came to about $50 billion in Chinese goods. And the hope, of course, was that I would bring the Chinese back to the table. The Chinese would uh, make some changes that were sufficient to the United States. Instead, what happened is that the Chinese government decided that it would retaliate with their own $50 billion in tariffs. So they just basically offset the $50 billion that the U.S. had put on. Um, the U.S. government then upped the ante and said, well, you're going to put on $50 billion? We're going to put on $500 billion more, so 10 times more than what the Chinese government had put on. And the problem with those, and that is, that is what was called list three and four, the problem legally with those um, additional tariffs was that there's a good argument, I think, uh, under the law that they're not permitted because they go well beyond the scope of the original uh, investigation, which was on a discrete $50 billion in, uh, in, 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 in uh, retaliation. And so when we're looking at 10 times as much, uh, even though the Chinese did, you know, counter-retaliate and, and, and did retaliate, 500 billion, billion as counter-retaliation seems um, arguably at least to be something that is, is way beyond what the law allows. The result of that is that you've had something like 6,000 cases filed in the U.S. Court of International Trade now on this issue, including many that our firm has, has filed. And the idea behind that was to sort of get in line, make the best arguments on this at 25%. Uh, it's well worth it to a lot of companies to file these lawsuits. Uh, the cost is relatively minor for most, most companies to do this, so they thought we'll take a chance and file these. That, that lawsuit is now pending. Uh, it's been remanded once uh, from the Court of International Trade back to USTR. Uh, it's now pending again um, before USTR. Probably we'll have either an oral argument or a decision either by the end of this year or probably more likely early next year on this case. Um, but whatever happens, I would think, uh, is going to go up to the next level, which is the U.S. Court of uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in D.C. There's there's just way too much uh, at stake. It, it, I don't know the exact number because it changes day to day, but it's probably somewhere around seven hundred billion dollars at stake at this point. Uh, clearly, the administration. Uh, even though the Biden administration wasn't the one that initially put these tariffs on, they, they, they don't want to give up $700 billion if they don't have to. So they've, they've defended this quite strongly, and my guess is we'll continue to do so. Um, the, the question then becomes for companies that are suffering under this 25% additional tariffs, um, uh, what can be done? Uh, at the moment, the administration has not reopened uh, the uh, exemption process. There, there was a process early on to allow for exemptions from the 25% duties, particularly in situations where uh, companies certainly cer simply could not get um, the product in the United States. 
uh, and um, thus, I mean, all that was going to happen is effectively we were putting a tax on ourselves uh, as Americans, and there were, you know, several exemptions that were granted under that provision. That, that process, however, has ended. Uh, it may reopen. There's been a fair amount of pressure from people uh, on Capitol Hill on both sides of the aisle to reopen it. Uh, there is a um, dispute, I would say, within the administration on this issue. Uh, the Treasury Department uh, and Janet Yellen are um, sort of inclined to say we ought to ease up at least on some of these tariffs because it's only adding to inflation and is frankly not doing very much good to get the Chinese to the table anymore. Um, on the other hand, the U.S. Trade Representative uh, seems to be taking the view that by and large, this gives them some sort of leverage uh, with the, uh, the Chinese in negotiations, so we should keep them on. So uh, at the moment, nothing's been done, and uh, I think it's fair to say that at this point, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative has more or less won that uh, argument for the time being, but we'll see what happens uh, going forward. My next topic is um, a different trade provision, and one that um, some of you may be familiar with who are in the, the solar panels uh, business or are familiar with what happened there. It is um, uh, a particularly um, interesting thing as a, as a trade lawyer to see this. And we, again, have been pretty deeply involved in this with several of our, our clients. Uh, first of all, uh, probably need to understand what, what an anti-dumping and countervailing duty case is. Uh, anti-dumping cases, um, are applied country by country uh, on products and against countries that are selling uh, at below fair value. And it's a long discussion on what below fair value means, but it's unfairly low pricing, basically. Countervailing duties, somewhat similar concept, but the concept behind that is that there's government subsidies in the foreign countries that are leading to um, uh, unfair pricing in the United States, and therefore we're going to offset that with an additional duty. Both of these uh, can lead to very substantial additional duties. At the moment, there is a case, there is a, an order, uh, both an anti-dumping and countervailing duty order, on China on cells and modules. And so the question uh, before the Commerce Department is, you know, is that enough? In other words, the uh, one U.S. Uh, producer uh, brought a new case under the anti-circumvention provisions and uh, alleged that the Chinese products were being sent, not, not in their entirety, this is not about transshipments, uh, but it's simply about uh, some components of the uh, final module being sent to places like Vietnam, Malaysia, Cambodia, Thailand, and being made into products that were then declared product of Malaysia, product of uh, Vietnam, for example. And being product of a different country meant that those products were no longer subject to the Chinese orders. They were free of any anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Um, this case was brought, um, and it, it same, soon became apparent that because there was possibly very, very large dumping duties that could be applied, even in excess of 100% of the entered value, and that um, those duties could go back at least until April 1st of 2022, when the case was initiated, and maybe even before, that this could completely shut down a bunch of projects that were under, uh, under uh, uh, in, in process, I should say, uh, by producers in the United States, by uh, companies in the United States. So it basically shut down, at least initially, um, the U.S. solar panel installation uh, uh, industry. And strangely, of course, and it's, it's 
pretty apparent, I guess, is that this was completely contrary to things that the administration was trying to do in encouraging uh, clean energy. So um, what happened uh, immediately after that announcement on April 1st is that the importers, the users of the products in the United States went to the White House, said this is a disaster, you've, you've done something that is just unprecedented to completely shut down an industry. And we're successful and, and in a really an unprecedented um, way, the administration um, decided that they would temporarily put a halt to these circumvention cases against these four Southeast East Asian countries and did so uh, in June. Um, that was, uh, as I said, unprecedented. Uh, they put a two-year halt on the, um, uh, the circumvention cases going into effect. They did say in doing so that they were going to continue to do the investigation so that the duties that might be put in would be would go into effect after the two years. So it's not a, uh, a situation where the duties would be gone forever, but there is at least a two year period where the solar industry can uh, get through and at least complete the current um, uh, projects. Now, the, the problem, of course, is two years goes pretty quickly and people are already beginning to think about what happens at the end of the two years. Uh, there was a final rule that was put into effect um, recently, um, just about two weeks ago, actually, um, which uh, sort of finalizes this pause in the circumvention cases, but does say that there can't be stockpiling of the, uh, the solar panels at the end of the um, at the end of the period, which is something that the U.S. industry was fearing. So the rule that they've put out uh, essentially says that there'll be 180 days where you can use uh, the inputs, the, the solar panels uh, that have come in. Uh, you can use that for 180 days, or sell them 180 days after importation. But then after that, uh, the exemption is gone. So um, it's put some limit on the possibility to have huge stockpiles on the uh, on the importations. Um, in a way, I think you can see solar panels as a really special exemption. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, to the extent that there are circumvention cases uh, on other products that you're seeing that have anti-dumping or countervailing duties uh, cases on them, order, orders on them, it's something that companies should be very aware of because this can be a really serious problem, uh, not only for solar panels, but, but for other products going forward. So something to be aware of when you see something like this come up, um, uh, you know, contact somebody um, in the legal community who, who does this kind of work and, and talk it through because it, it could be something that could have a, a pretty dire effect on on business in the worst case. Final thing I want to talk about is um, something that's also pretty new, um, uh, Uyghur sanctions. And these, these are goods that are made from forced labor. And forced labor uh, prohibitions have been in, in, uh, in force in the United States for many years. I think it goes back to the, the Tariff Act in 1930, actually. But you know, this particular uh, uh, group of sanctions are much more targeted on the Uyghur area of China, Xinjiang province. And um, it says that the new requirements, and this went into effect at the end of uh, 2021, but have been fully implemented in June of this year. The new requirements uh, demand that even minute amounts of inputs from the Uyghur region cannot be included in products shipped to the United States. Now, without a de minimis uh, exemption, you can imagine what this could do. 
um, it, it, it's potentially uh, a disaster for certain products. And two of them are mentioned on my, on my slide here, which are cotton and silica. Obviously silica is, is, a, is a major issue for uh, producers uh, on, on solar panels. Uh, that's been, I think the people, most of the people that I'm aware of uh, have been working through that with their suppliers uh, on silica, but we're also seeing it in other areas uh, such as cotton. And I can give you uh, a pretty com concrete example of a, of a client of ours that was importing some apparel uh, from Vietnam. Um, nothing to do, nothing from the Uyghur region as far as they know. They checked out everything that they could to make sure that there was nothing coming in from the Uyghur region. Um, nevertheless, there is an allegation uh, by Customs and Border Protection uh, that they believe that there's a problem with these importations. They detain the goods uh, in the port and uh, we're not trying to work out uh, what we can provide to them to, you know, get, to get these goods released. Um, the problem is that the amount of information that has to be provided is really incredibly detailed. Um, you have to go back not only to your immediate supplier, which could be a trading company or a producer, but, but if you look at something like apparel, you got to go back to the supplier of the supplier and sometimes the supplier of the supplier of the supplier. And you need to then tie all of that information back to the financial statements of each of those people who are providing inputs and show that to uh, Customs and Border Protection and show you, hey, there's no way that this possibly could have been coming from the Uyghur region. And the standard that is applied uh, to companies, uh, importers, is that we have to show that by clear and convincing evidence. And the burden is completely upon the importer to prove the negative. So I think you can get a pretty good idea on how hard this is to address. Um, they've also put out, out uh, this is CBP has put out an entities list on sort of the bad actors out there that is easily accessible. But I don't think the big problem right now are the entities. I think the bigger problem is people who aren't on the entities list and where um, Customs and Border Protection has uh, come to the conclusion for whatever reason, and they, they, don't, they will not share that with you, but they will come to the conclusion that your product is somehow connected to the Uyghur region. What we've been doing with clients is to work through how to create a practical compliance program. And, and I mean, and the word practical, I think is very important in this because if you think about it, if you've got a thousand SKUs that you're bringing in, there's no way on earth that you're gonna be able to trace back every one of those SKUs to the point where you're gonna be able to show with this high degree of certainty that's being required that they don't come from the Uyghur region. Um, so fortunately for, for my client in the, in the issue that I, I just discussed, this is a pretty minor item, this piece of apparel, it's a Christmas item and it's not a big deal, but um, you know, there may be items that are a big deal. So what we're suggesting as we go forward uh, with clients is to think about it on a, on a really practical business point of view. That is, take a look at what your most important products are that could be affected by these Uyghur sanctions and really drill down on those and try to have a really robust compliance program in place, at least for those items. Um, it'd be great to have it for everything if you can do it, but as a practical matter, uh, I'm a little skeptical that everybody's gonna be able to do that. So uh, at least get the sort of bet the company items uh, in good shape, and that will be worth um, a lot to you if you can do that. So that's sort of uh, the three Big items that I have, um, glad to answer any questions at the end of all of this. Doug? 
Thanks, Jeff. I'm just gonna, we have just a couple more topics to run through quickly, um, but I'll try and move fast so that we can get to some Thanks, questions. <laughs> oh, you're all good. Uh, questions for Doug and Jeff. Um, but under, first I'll discuss the zero emission nuclear power production credit under 45U. Um, this is effectively a new credit. Um, it starts in 2024 and runs through 2032, um, but it is applicable to existing facilities. So facilities that were placed in service before August 16th, 2022, which was when the, the IRA was enacted, uh, it applies to those facilities that use nuclear power to generate electricity and that did not receive advanced nuclear production tax credit allocation under 45J, which is a similar, um, which is a similar credit in existence. Uh, the amount of the PTC uh, for zero emission nuclear power is 0.3 cents per kilowatt hour. This is going to be adjusted for inflation, of course. Uh, and it is subject to reduction as the price of electricity rises. So this is intended to operate as a, a form of a safety net. So in case energy prices uh, decrease, uh, this credit can sort of supplement uh, these nuclear power facilities. Uh, and then when electricity prices rise, the credit is reduced, um, similar to uh, much of the other credits we've discussed in this series. Uh, there is a five times multiplier in this case. Um, if you satisfy the prevailing wage requirements, you will qualify for the multiplier. Next is the energy efficient uh, commercial building and deduction extension and modification under section 179D. Um, as the title indicates, this is an extension and modification of a pre-existing uh, provision or a pre-existing deduction. Uh, so if you are making certain improvements that are energy efficient uh, to a building, then you can take specific deductions. And to qualify for this, um, the efficiency must increase by 25% or more as a result of the improvements. Uh, and so this is the adjustment to the efficiency requirement. Uh, and then there's a modification to the deduction structure. Uh, so it begins at 50 cents per square foot and it's increased um, based on certain requirements uh, with a maximum amount of $1 per square foot. Uh, and then of course you have these five times multipliers that can take place if you satisfy prevailing wage and in this case, apprenticeship requirements. Um, there's a cap on the deduction. Um, it's the lesser of either the cost of the qualifying property reduced by um, the aggregate amount deducted in the three prior years, or the dollar amount multiplied by the square footage of the building also reduced by the aggregate amount deducted in the prior three years. Um, there are also provisions um, that apply to retrofits. Uh, so that's something that should also be considered in this realm. And another note, any tax exempt entity can allocate the deduction to the designer of the building or if you're doing a retrofit, the retrofit plan. Under 45W, there is a credit for qualified commercial clean vehicles. And this provision is effectively an update to the credit amount that taxpayers can claim with respect to certain plug-in electric vehicles under section 30D. Um, but this is this updates the credit and uh, the credit amount is 15% of the vehicle's basis or if it is not powered at all by gas or diesel, then 30% or the incremental cost of the vehicle as compared to um, a comparable vehicle. And then the credit has caps, um, $40,000 and $7,500, depending on the weight of the vehicle at issue. Uh, and then there are also battery capacity requirements. Again, um, 
these requirements are contingent upon the weight of the vehicle. Uh, lastly, it's worth noting that uh, only vehicles made by qualified manufacturers um, qualify for the credit. And to be a qualified manufacturer, you have to have a written agreement uh, with the Treasury, and that involves some compliance measures where you provide reports. Um, and the credit applies to vehicles acquired after 2022 and uh, through 2032. Um, a couple other things, the Section 4611C reinstated the Hazardous Substance Superfund, which was a fund created a while ago that had phased out in uh, 1995 with respect. Um, the fund was designed to, to create um, some capital for, to assist with cleanup uh, for chemical deposits, spills of hazardous materials, and so forth. Um, but the IRA um, reinstates the Superfund and it takes effect beginning next year. And then under sections 41 and 3111, there's an increase in the research credit, uh, which can be used against payroll tax for small businesses. Uh, so this is already in effect, but um, beginning with 2023, the credit increases. Uh, so that's if you're a small business, then that is something to do, take in consideration. And then lastly, um, there's a reinstatement of limitation rules for deduction for state and local taxes. Um, there's no change here. We're just making a note of it because there was a proposal to increase up from the $10,000 cap, um, but that was not ultimately enacted. Um, I think we might have a couple of minutes left if you have questions. Uh, so please feel free to submit those to the chat if you have them. Uh, and as you're thinking of questions, I'll go run through just a couple of the closing remarks. Uh, just a reminder we that this is approved for legal education. Uh, so to report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we will send a certificate of attendance along with the recording uh, and along with any questions and answers that we might not get to, uh, to you next week. And please, if you have a chance, complete our short survey. Um, doesn't look like we have any questions yet, but we will stick around for just a couple more minutes to see if any pop up. Maybe I'd just like to add one thing, which I probably should have said at the outset is, you know, what's the connection between what I'm talking about in international trade and the tax issues that we're talking about? And one very strong connection, which you probably already picked up on, is that as part of President Biden's pausing of the circumvention cases that I talked about on solar panels, he wanted to give, you know, in addition to the stick, which was basically what he was doing to the U.S. domestic industry on solar panels, he also wanted to give them a carrot, and part of that carrot was what we saw in terms of the tax uh, reforms or the tax breaks. Well, it appears we don't have any questions, uh, so that means well done, uh, Jeff and Jacob. We covered everything that could possibly be covered. Uh, but thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Um, hope you all have a great day.